Hi everyone, my name is Katya and I'm a producer at Stroka Institute. Welcome everybody who is watching us on YouTube, Facebook and Contacta. I would like to welcome Filippo Santonio de Sio, the speaker of our public program Stroka 2020 Live. Filippo is a philosopher and teaches ethics of technology at TU Delft and reporter of the EU Commission Expert Group to advise on ethical issues raised by driverless mobility. Filippo is an expert in matters of human control and responsibility for emerging technologies. He will tell us today about how technology design learns from philosophy and vice versa. There will be a Q&A session after the lecture, so please do not hesitate to post your questions on YouTube, Facebook or Contacti, and I will pass them to Filippo. The lecture will be in English with a simultaneous translation into Russian. For uh, the Russian version, open uh, stroke our page um, Stroke Institute page on, uh, on Contact and Russian Facebook. English version is available on our YouTube and English Facebook. So have a great time watching and I shall pass the word to Filippo. Thank you very much, Katya, for your kind invitation to this uh, talk and for the nice presentation. Uh, indeed, my name is Filippo Santoni de Sio. I work in the Netherlands. The slides you see right now is a, quite an old picture of the city of my university, Delft. That's a famous painting by uh, Johannes Vermeer, the famous Flemish uh, painter. This is actually how the uh, campus where I work looks like, which is pretty much more modern and less charming than the city, old city itself. But the old city is still quite uh, nice. So uh, a bit of background uh, about what I have done so far. So I, I, as Katya said, I was, uh, I've studied philosophy all the way since I was uh, younger. And uh, I'm Italian. I studied in Torino. And my very first book was uh, on the philosophical foundation of criminal responsibility. Um, this is just to say that I've always tried to use philosophy as a tool to understand uh, the world, so to speak, and not just as a intellectual enterprise uh, for its own sake. So I first tried to connect philosophy and, and, and law uh, and also psychology. Uh, and then since I moved to Delft back in 2012, I moved to ethics of technology and started investigating issues, uh, societal issues, human issues raised by the advancements in, in technology. And yeah, I must confess at some point I also gave up on a passion of my youth, and I also published this book on the philosophy of football in Italian. Unfortunately, unfortunately, or luckily for you, you cannot read it unless you speak some Italian. Um, the topic of today is this. So basically, to cut a, a long story short, whether we like it or not, our future is full of artificial intelligence and robots. This is just a fact. Um, so devices and, to, and systems like the ones we have on our smartphones will take more and more space in our life. They will uh, 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 assist us in, uh, in, in our healthcare practices. They will uh, participate in warfare. They will uh, uh, operate us in a surgical theater. They will take financial decisions. Uh, they will uh, set the stage for human interactions, the way we're doing right now, by the way, through these online uh, lectures and so on and so forth. Now, as I said, I'm Italian, and Italian people like to vote. You know that. We have elections every other year. So I would like to start with a poll, with a question to you guys um, who are listening to me right now. So when you think of this future full of uh, robots and artificial intelligence. What is your first reaction? There are two options here. There are those who say, you know, thanks to this technology, uh, we will all be uh, uh, smarter, uh, everything will be more comfortable, and we will be uh, happier, healthier, uh, everything will be easier, we will be richer even, etc., etc. So let's call this the dream view. Uh, so if you are for this view, you can just type dream in, in the chat. But there's another option, uh, which we will call the uh, doom option. And it's a following. So many people think that, no, this technology will eventually, it's, it's an illusion of happiness, will eventually turn against us. We will become less happy. Uh, we will become unemployed. The technology will damage us, will even enslave us, damage us, dehumanize us, or even kill us somehow. 
This is sort of a doom scenario. So are you for the dream or for the doom scenario? So we have, let's say, some seconds to just type uh, what is your vision of the future with robots and artificial intelligence. Is it dream? So, you know, you will be in, you know, uh, pampered and, and cuddled and everything will be easier or everything will become a nightmare like in the worst science fiction films. I'm looking at Katya to hear what the public is, is saying before moving on. Who is winning the elections? Exciting. Dream or doom? Nobody's voting. I'm just kidding. We're waiting. I think we shall. I think we shall summarize after at the end of the lecture. That's okay. That's interesting. Okay, so even more exciting. Anyway, in my experience, there's no clear winner in this election. You always have a lot of people dreaming of a future, uh, of a bright future, uh, uh, with these technologies, and some people fearing a, a, a dark future of, of technological uh, nightmare and, and dooms. And, you know, this, this is not a surprise because I believe that both scenarios are still possible and open. And everything will depend, and that's the topic of today, on the question whether we will be able, as a society, to govern and direct technology in the right direction. So this is the topic of today. Can we... Uh, control technology and artificial intelligence in particular. Uh, you know, this is actually a, uh, an old story, at least in, in science fiction. And I'm sure that all uh, people who are, you know, film lovers will recognize this picture of HAL 9000 in uh, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, where you have this fantastic uh, computer governing the spaceship uh, all across the universe. And, they, and the crew of the, of, the, of the ship can enjoy their trip, uh, just relying on this smart and kind and, and intelligent and even, you know, a charming computer governing all of their activities. So this is the dream part of the technologies. But here comes the spoiler uh, for those who haven't seen the film. But come on, this is a film from the 60s. You should have seen it by now. Uh, so shame on you if you haven't. Just kidding. Um, but in the second part of the film, what happens is that, as it happens in many of these films, uh, technology turns against their creators. And this computer becomes so smart and so ambitious that it decides that he wants to take control of the spaceship and possibly of the universe. Uh, and so this struggle, struggle between humans and technology uh, uh, starts. Now, this is science fiction, but I want to, what I want to say is that you guys who have voted for the Doom Party and who feel that this can become more than a, a science fiction story, that this can become a reality, you guys, you have a point. So I do believe that there are some serious risks that technology can take over. Maybe not in the way, not literally in the way that is described in these films and books, but in different ways. So in the first part of this lecture, I will try to convince you that there is a serious risk for us to lose control over artificial intelligence and robots. In the second part, I will try to, to explain how I think we should try to prevent this. Now, before we start, uh, I've just taken for granted so far that you know what artificial intelligence and robots are. So before we start, just a couple of words to explain what this is. So basically, Artificial intelligence uh, is that set of systems that try to um, think and to perform tasks that so far were considered to be possible only for humans. So not only doing calculations, not only doing pre-programmed actions, but interpreting a language, uh, coming up with original decision-making processes, and so on and so forth. So one example would be any of this. I will take example from the commercial space because it's easier. Uh, it's for non-professionals. But, you know, these home assistants that are around now, like the Google Voice or Alexa, etc., etc. What, what these systems do is basically just interpreting your voice 
translating your voice and your sounds into some concepts, uh, understanding, as it were, your question, and taking a decision about what is the best answer to give to you based on some information they had, but also based on the, inter the previous interaction with you. So in a way that try to mimic uh, the way human mind works. So this is, in a nutshell, artificial intelligence. Any system that try to interpret uh, information to come up with original decision making and to give an output that makes kind of sense or is helpful to that person so the system is interacting with it. Now, what is a robot? A robot is just artificial. You should not necessarily imagine, you know, the Android robots uh, like we see in films, but in technical terms, a robot is any artificial intelligence with some possibility to, to do physical action in the space having legs or wheels or arms or, or whatever can help moving and doing stuff in the, in, the, in the physical space, in the bodily space. And my favorite example, by the way, next month is my birthday, so if you want to make a gift to me, my favorite example is the robot vacuum cleaner. It's my dream, right? So you just have this thing that uh, goes around your apartment, it, it sees the furniture, it gets around them, it sees where it's still dirty, it cleans it up when it's, you know, when it's uh, the battery is down, it goes autonomously to the battery charger and so on and so forth. So it's just artificial intelligence with the capacity to move and to perform tasks in the physical and bodily uh, environment. Um, now, back to our question, how can it happen that robots uh, may go outside of control? So in order to understand why this is possible right now more than in the future with previous technologies, we need to understand uh, what has changed, uh, what, why, are, what's new with artificial intelligence as we know it right now, uh, as opposed to old school computers and old school technologies. So the best way to understand this is to look at the way we can conceive of controlling this technology. So old school technologies were a bit like the ones you see on the, on the left side of the screen. So they were dumb systems. It was just mechanical stuff, pre-programmed stuff. So what, and there would be one or a few controllers, so people directly acting on the technology in order to, on the, you know, the device or the system in order to bring changes into the system. So, you know, the standard example of someone pulling uh, and throwing switches, and in this way, controlling a train or whatever it's outside, outside the control room. Now, this was, old school, this was the old school uh, technology. Uh, intelligent systems, which is the topic of today, like artificial intelligent robots, uh, especially in the, in the last generation, their last generation are different because just take as an example, my favorite example, and you know, I have this colleague from Siena in Italy, and this is a picture from a photo uh, from the Palio, which is this horse race in the middle of a city, in the city center. Now, if I would ask you, who is controlling that horse? What would be your answer? It's not easy, right? You could say, well, it's the guy driving the horse. But you perfectly know that the horse has a personality in itself and it develops this personality. And the horse itself is sensitive to the inputs coming from the outside, to the other horses, to the audience screaming at them. And so that's why, by the way, we put these uh, protections for the eyes of the horses, because the horse can change their behaviors based on the input they receive. You may go a step further and say that, after all, is the guy who has designed the fair who is controlling the whole thing because of the way the whole um, race has been designed and the rules of the game, et cetera, et cetera. So when we think of robots and artificial intelligence, we should think in this way. These are systems that are not designed once for all. So once these systems are out there in the, in the, in the wild, uh, as it is said, uh, they will start behaving in ways that are not necessarily pre-programmed which is the exciting part of the story, which is that's why they kind of resemble human intelligence uh, more than all technology. But at the same time, is also the challenging and potentially creepy part. These systems may start behaving 
in ways that are not predictable and not even understandable, even by designers. And from a design perspective, I know that there, that there are some designers, uh, possible architects and, uh, in, in the audience. So for you guys, this is a game changer because in the past, the role of the designer and the role of the user was clearly separated. You would have the designer projecting the technology, designing the technology, and then you would have the user with the limited options and, you know, the technology remaining as it is, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, with new technologies, what happens is that as a user, by interacting with the technology, you are co-designing the technology. You are giving input to the technology to change. And you see that also with your simple, relatively simple forms of artificial intelligence, like the ones you have in your smartphone or the one embedded in, in search engines. They change their behavior based on the interaction with you, and you can change the settings, and you can intentionally or less intentionally uh, interact and change the way they behave. So they become a dynamic, almost living systems, uh, uh, changing and living as sort of a symbiosis with the users and most also importantly, with other people who are not directly using the system but are intentionally or not intentionally interacting with, with them within the metaphor of the paleo would be the audience, right? So this is why I hope I just wanted to convey the message that this is really something new. Could be interesting, could be fun, uh, could be, uh, you know, concerning, etc. But what is important is that we agree that this is uh, new. Now, what can go wrong uh, with this technology? In what way can we lose control on technology and why does that matter? So I want to propose four ways in which uh, things can go wrong and things can go out of control, even though not necessarily the way in which it happens in, in science fiction films, but still in ways that are worth considering very seriously. So the first way in which we may lose control over AI and robots, I would say AI uh, for artificial intelligence from now on, on AI and robots, is, uh, is the following. So robots may create a big shift of power in favor of a handful of people, a few people, uh, companies or states. So put it simple, this is something you have probably read many ways in media reports. Those who are in control of the data which feed and make these systems work, these guys, these persons, these companies, these states will become super powerful. Uh, they will be able to uh, control your behavior, both in the sense of having uh, a massive amount of information about you in real time, uh, every day, etc., etc., and also in the other way. They will be able to influence you by putting data and information into the behavior of the systems with which you interact. So the, obvious, the most obvious example how in two, three simple steps this could happen is the Cambridge Analytica scandal, which I'm sure you are familiar with. So what happened is that it all started with an apparently innocuous uh, application on Facebook. So basically you are just spending your time on Facebook, you're on your sofa, and at some point there is this app saying, hey, do you want to try this app? What this app does is an extension of Facebook. What it does, it just uh, check all your activity on Facebook and it will make an interesting personality test and telling you what kind of person you are. They say, oh, that's fun, cool, let's do that. You click on that and then there is this long page of terms and conditions say, okay, by accepting these, you're accepting that, you say whatever. Uh, I don't mind. And so you click on continue and, and the game is done. At that point, you have given access to all your personal information on your Facebook uh, to this external app. Now what happened is that this external app has this pool of data and they know that this data are super valuable uh, because if you have the right scientific and technological tools with this data, you can do fantastic things. And so this data, long story short, was sold to this other company. And this other company used this data eventually uh, to support certain governments in, in their attempt at influencing elections, like the American elections or the Brexit referendum and so on and so forth. So what's fascinating, but also creeping this story is that 
you, you think you haven't done anything special. You were just playing on your Facebook. Uh, and you think that was just an innocuous game, but you were contributing uh, without knowing that in creating this massive pool of data that was then accumulated in the hands of this company who could then use that for big political projects or big economic projects that may turn against you. So that's the way in which technology can turn against you. Uh, and I would call this shifts of power. The second way in which technology may turn against you is the following. It has to do with technology replacing us in uh, our jobs. This is another old story, right? So we have had this fear of becoming unemployed because of technology for a long time. It was there in the first industrial revolution with, you know, with a mechanical robots entering the factory floors. And then we had the same fear with the first generation of computers back in the 60s. And now we have the same fear. So there are some people say, you know what? We are sick and tired about this fear. We know the story. In the beginning, people are fearing this. But then what happens is that, no, in the long run, everything goes well because this technology destroys some jobs but creates other jobs. And in the long run, this is typically what the economists say, in the long run, the overall result would be, will be positive. Some people will lose jobs, but many other jobs will be created. There will be a transition time, but in the long run, as a society, we will be all right. I think this time may be different. It's not just me saying that. There are a lot of also economists and experts in business and technology uh, and sociology who would agree with me. And this is one book by Martin Ford, uh, The Rise of Robots, of the robots who basically uh, present a good case to support the idea that this time can be different. So just looking at the past is not the right thing to do right now. Why is it different this time? Well, uh, for a couple of important reasons. First of all, as I said, this time technology is not only replacing our physical jobs. It's not just about muscles, it's about minds. So technology this time will be able to replace a lot of mental work. And this is totally new. So in the past, we would have machines replacing uh, repetitive works in factory. We would have computers making calculations for us, but we would still need having people putting the data in, people analyzing the results of these calculations. So the role of the computers and machines were very, was very limited. What the, futures will, the future we are looking at is a, is a future in which machines are replacing a, a broader set of tasks. Machines will be able to do jobs that were unthinkable uh, uh, for machines before. They will be able to do medical diagnosis, accountancy, uh, uh, financial transactions. Uh, they will be able to uh, acquire data on their own, analyzing data on their own. So, you know, there is this good old wisdom say, you know, machine can work with humans, but you will always need humans to, you know, to put data into them, to analyze data, or to make, you know, the maintenance of the machine, to program the machines. Well, not really. So the next generation of machines will be able to replace us in, in mental jobs. We will have... Uh, journalist machines uh, putting news together. We will have machines, as far as I'm concerned, as a researcher in the university, we will have machines putting together a research article and a scientific hypothesis just by elaborating data and recognizing patterns in, in, in the way. So future generation machines will be able to imitate a lot of what the humans can do. So I'm not saying that they will be able to do everything I'm not saying that they will be uh, undistinguishable from uh, human persons, not at all. They will be relatively stupid compared to humans in many tasks, but they will be super powerful in other tasks so that a lot of the jobs that we are used, we used to see as typical of humans will be done by machines. Now, why is this technology taking over? In a way, it is because uh, we are looking at a future in which humans, oh, I mean, one possible option for the future is one in which humans will be left 
with only the super difficult creative managerial tasks, just a few persons, you know, those who are running the big tech companies, the gigs in the Silicon Valley coming out with new apps and new programs, et cetera, et cetera. Those jobs will remain for sure. And then you will, we will have, you know, the very uh, ill-paid jobs like waiters or cleaning persons. Why? Because typically, uh, this is a bit of ironic, but robots are very bad at things that are quite simple for human persons, like moving in a crowded uh, restaurant while carrying uh, uh, dishes, plates, and, and glasses. For some reason, it's super difficult to program a robot to you know, uh, swiftly move into a crowded places, for instance. So waiters will remain, uh, and, and cleaning persons will remain, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of the typical middle-class jobs, uh, um, office jobs, uh, will be gone. And again, why is that a problem? Well, it is a problem, obviously, not only because these people will remain unemployed and without a salary. There could be solutions for that. There could be new forms of state subsidies, et cetera, et cetera. But what is concerning is that for a lot of people, there will be a loss of meaning, as you can read on the slide. So people will have a hard time finding the meaning in their life. So I understand this may sound like a very philosophical notion, but it's not. It's a very concrete thing. You will wake up in the morning, maybe you will have some money to spend because then you may have some subsidy or stuff, but you may not know who you are anymore and what's your role in the world. So in this way, technology, again, is not necessarily destroying, literally destroying humanity or taking over the world, but it may take away meaning from our life, from the life of many persons. The third uh, risk I see uh, in technology uh, and artificial intelligence is the following. You know, there was this old British uh, TV show called uh, Little Breeding, and there was this character uh, uh, working on a computer and having, you know, uh, a job in which they, he would assist customers and the public with, with, with things. And at some point, she would just type stuff into a computer and she would say, sorry, computer says no. So again, at the time, back in the days, that, that was a caricature of someone who would delegate important tasks to the computer without even understanding uh, how the computer works and just taking for granted whatever comes from the computer. Now, unfortunately, again, this is something that may become quite uh, common in our future life. Um, Here's a simple example. You apply for a job, um, you fill in the application, et cetera, et cetera, or you apply for a mortgage or whatever you think is important in your life. Um, and then, exactly like in Little Britain, uh, someone, you receive an email saying, sorry, you haven't been selected for this job, or sorry, you don't qualify to get a mortgage or a loan from a bank. Um, and then, you know, the most natural thing for you to do would be to ask why. You want to understand, you want to know whether the, the selection procedure was fair, you want to possibly, uh, you know, uh, contest the decision or, you know, or at least you want to learn for the future and to, you know, to, 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 to change your, your to, to, to complete your curriculum or to whatever, to change something in the future to get things uh, different in the future, but like in Little Britain, you may receive this answer like, sorry, we have no idea why you have been, uh, your application has been turned down. The system has just elaborating all your data based on some form of artificial intelligence and algorithm based on a match with some database, etc. But the system is so complex that we have no idea why you have been selected or not. We just know that the system is very powerful, so we trust the system, and you should trust the system. Now, again, why is this a problem? Uh, you know, there are some people, people in the dream party who would say, okay, that's all right. Uh, the system is more intelligent than we are. Uh, it can just, uh, you know, elaborate and analyze more data than we could ever do in the same time, so we should just trust it. The problem is that if you believe as I do in, in the importance of transparency and liberal democracy, 
Uh, you just don't want to trust the power. You just don't want to say, okay, I just trust that these guys or these systems or these institutions are doing their job. And I'm happy with that. And I will accept whatever they do because I know that they are working for our uh, um, uh, well-being. Well, no, well, I, I, I want to know how, does, how that works before trusting it, right? And if we go more and more in the direction of these complex interactive systems, analyzing big data, massive amount of different data coming from different sources through complex mechanisms that are partially uh, not understandable, definitely to the uh, lay persons, but sometimes even to the experts, then we are running the risk of what it's called in the, in the, in the jargon, an accountability gap. So basically, what is an accountability gap? It's a situation in which something happens, something important, something affecting the life of people, and people want to know what's going on for the reasons I mentioned before. And this is not possible because there is nobody who is capable or willing or bold to give an explanation, to give a meaningful explanation of what happened. This is the accountability gap risk. Again, it's not technology taking over as in destroying you, killing you, but it's still technology uh, reducing our capacity to understand what's going on and taking on decisions and information from, from normal persons. Now, the last example is, uh, is as close as it gets to the Terminator, if you want, to the technology physically harming or killing you without you being able to prevent that or even to understand what was going on. And in order to understand this risk, I just need to take, uh, unfortunately, I don't need to make up a story uh, because there is a, uh, a real story that happened. Uh, actually, there are a couple of them, but the most tragic one is the one happened in Arizona, USA, uh, in 2018, uh, two years ago. Uh, I'm sure you, you have uh, read this news. Uh, so Uber was testing, uh, with the permission of the Arizona, of the state of Arizona, a self-driving car um, on, on the public road. Uh, so a self-driving car is a vehicle that is equipped with cameras and sensors. You see a picture there and a, a powerful computer artificial intelligence. And what they do is basically replacing the human drivers by elaborating, you know, as I say, in artificial intelligence works, it elaborates information coming from sensors and cameras. It somehow sees the road and can drive uh, um, across the road uh, without the, the human driver doing anything. Now, in that specific version, there was actually a human driver on board who was supposed to intervene in case something uh, went wrong. And actually something went wrong. And what happened is that was there was a lady crossing the road with her bicycle in the night. So it was pretty dark and this person was crossing the road outside uh, uh, the pedestrian um, crossing, uh, the zebra crossing. And so the car didn't spot that person. And the driver was busy doing something else, checking their phone. And what happened is that unfortunately the car ran over the lady and the lady was killed. Now, this is uh, a robot, right? This, is, this vividly represents the difference between a robot and a simple AI um, because it's a physical thing hitting you. Now, the question is, who is to blame for the death of this poor person? You may say, hey, is, is clearly the company, they were not supposed to, to put this car on the road if the car was not even able to spot a person. But the company may say, hey, no, not really. We put a person on board precisely because the technology was not good enough. But a person could say, hey, but I didn't receive any specific training for this kind of driving. I just had a normal driving license. And when I did my driving license, there was no such a thing as a self-driving car. So don't, don't blame me. And you know what? How about the government who allowed this car on the road and me driving this car? So what this situation uh, represents is what is called a responsibility gap. So it is unclear. So someone has been killed 
And we are not clear who was supposed to do what in order to prevent this uh, death. Why? Because there are different persons and institutions involved and everything is new and everything is complex and interactive and dynamic. And we don't yet have the right concepts to make sense of who is supposed to do what in order to prevent uh, this death by technology. So again, it's not necessarily technology becoming super smart like in, in the uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, but it's technology becoming so complex so as to be able to kill people, literally. Um, while at the same time, nobody being really sure about who was supposed to do what in order to prevent this death. Um, now, you may still be wondering why, so this is a nice painting by Raphael, the School of Athens, representing the Greek philosophers and scientists in the old uh, Athen academia. And you may wonder why someone like me, who has always done just academic work, uh, should talk about this stuff. You may think this is stuff for engineers, politicians, uh, economists to, to sort out. Now, the reason is that I do believe that nowadays uh, philosophy still has a role to play because, as I said, and I, as I hope these concepts that I uh, quickly put um, on the table show, we are facing not only technological change, but a change in the meanings of concepts, the concept of power, the concept of political power, the concept of responsibility, accountability. What does it mean to, do, to work in this age? So we need some good philosophy to make sense, together with many other disciplines, not, not alone, to make sense of this change and to govern this change. We should avoid what uh, uh, the Belarus uh, journalist Evgeny Morozov has called solutionism. We should avoid the temptation to believe that we just need better technology and we will be all right. Is, this is a political problem. This is a societal problem. It's a philosophical problem. So technology is part of the story, but the way we will design technology, the way we will govern technology, uh, the way we will understand and make sense of technology is also an important part of the story. So in the last part of my lecture, I quickly want to uh, say something about what are we supposed to do. So I'm coming to the dream party. So you guys who say, no, I, I still believe we have a bright future in front of us. You know, I think you have a point, but there are a lot of things we should do uh, if we want this future to realize. We should not just wait for technology to do its course because otherwise it can really go wrong. So as a society, we should do something. But when, how, why, and what should we do? So the when part is pretty uh, simple in a way. Uh, it is now. So... The technology is already there, but it's not developed fully. So we still have the possibility to intervene. This is a nice quote uh, that points to what uh, a, the sociologist Colin Ridge has called uh, a, the dilemma of control. So we now call it the Colin Ridge dilemma. And in natural, the problem is that here's the dilemma. There is a moment in time in which the technology is not developed yet, and we still have the possibility to change it. But the problem is that at that time, we don't have sufficient knowledge of how the technology will look like. So we have control, but we don't have knowledge. The opposite is, if we wait for the technology to develop, then we will have all the knowledge about the uh, effects of technology on society and on humanity, but we will have little control. Why? Because once the technology is developed, introduced into the society, it's very difficult to change it. Just imagine that you now say, hey, I don't like Facebook. I don't like Google. I don't like smartphones. Man, too late. Now they are part of our life. There are super powerful economical and political interests in this technology. So it's too late to change it. So we should like, you should find the right moment in time where we have sufficient knowledge about the risks in the working of technology and still some control. And it's an open question whether this time is already gone for AI and robotics. Some people say it's already too late. Other people say, well, we still have some leeway. Anyway, for sure, uh, it is time now to do something, to design and to go over these technologies in a way that is uh, beneficial for society. And I don't want to make publicity uh, for my university 
because my university is not perfect and you know there are a lot of things that uh, should be improved in my university uh, so don't get me wrong but there's one thing I like very much about my university in Delft the Delft University of Technology and it's the structure of my faculty my faculty is called the faculty where I work is called technology policy and management and the whole idea is precisely to have under the same roof engineers social, social scientists lawyers psychologists philosophers economists all working together ideally then it's not easy it's just the start of a process towards what is called responsible innovation the idea is not that that innovation is not good in itself uh, it is good only so far as it uh, really gives something to uh, meaningful to humanity and to people and to all people and not just some of them so the why we should care is the following. So this is, as you may know, the, the motto of the National Rifle Association in the USA. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. Which is supposed to say, hey, don't blame uh, weapons and guns whenever there is a shooting because the responsibility is of the, of the shooters and not the guns or the technology. Which is true in a trivial and non-interesting way. Obviously, I don't want to jail guns. I don't want to blame, you know, to jail uh, or to punish uh, gun producers for shootings. But at the same time, as a matter of fact, it is also true that guns kill people in a way that other tools would not do. And uh, as a matter of fact, the more guns are around, the more shootings will happen. So technology is not neutral means that, uh, you know, there is the, this all saying, you know, technology is not good or bad. It all depends on how you use it. You can use it for good and for bad. I think this is not true, especially with present day technology. Uh, because design matters, and I'm talking again to designers in the, in the virtual room here. So the way we design technology will close opportunities uh, for certain people and open opportunities for others. And certain options will simply not be open anymore. So nowadays, you cannot decide not to give your data whenever you use the internet. So it's just impossible. If we want to use the technology, you have to use it that way. Um, and you have to use the technology if you want to have a job or to have any possible inter social interaction nowadays. So technology is influencing uh, dramatically the way we, we live. This is obvious. And so the way technology is designed will have a massive effect on the way we will be living. And we will not always have the choice whether to use that technology or not, or how to use that technology. So that's why we should uh, care now as citizens, as, as, as designers. Um, the what is the very last part of my, of my lecture, is what should we do? And in a nutshell, I think we should, my contribution as a philosopher is just changing our understanding what control means. Just, you remember uh, this slide I already showed. So nowadays we are looking at systems that are dynamic, intelligent, interactive. So the good old idea of controlling as, you know, throwing switches and doing stuff to control a simple device will not work. And the example of the self-driving cars, uh, uh, doing unpredictable thing and interacting the wrong way with the driver is a standard example of things that can go wrong with these intelligent technologies. But what I want to say in a nutshell is the following. We need a new concept of control. Um, the traditional concept of control in engineering is the following. This is just one example, uh, but you can apply it to all possible technologies. So whenever it comes to, for instance, say driving cars, you may have the idea that the more you have your hands on the steering wheel, the more you are in control. Or the more you can interact with your smartphone, the more you can control what the smartphone is doing for you and to you, and so on and so forth. Now, as a matter of fact, this is not true because uh, this could be a very shallow form of control. So physical control, physical interaction is not necessarily what will determine what's happening with the technology. So we need what we call, what I call and other call meaningful human controls. We want design systems 
that are able to respond not only to what individual users do, but also to what individual users need and to what other people in society need to our general goals, our general principles, and not only to the immediate actions of the people who interact with the technology or even more only to the goals and values and um, projects of the big companies and the few people who are able to uh, influence the overall behavior of this complex system. So this is a natural what is meaningful human control. It's a form of control that looks at the interaction or the complex interaction of technology with humanity uh, at the level of our principal values and try to design this principle and values in interaction with technology and not just leaving this interaction to the uh, superficial behavior of untrained users on the one hand and the general goal of the companies or the states controlling this technology. Now, I started by saying that uh, I'm a philosopher and I'm trying to give a small contribution to this. And I know that sometimes philosophy has a bad press as being something very old school and not up to date. Uh, uh, I hope I've shown that in these complex times, good old uh, philosophical questions are emerging again. Are we really free? Are we in control of our life? Uh, who is really controlling our lives? And so I believe that even good old philosophy, if it is subject to some restyling, uh, and if it is open to interaction with other disciplines, can have a role to play uh, in present-day society. So thank you very much for your attention so far, and I hope we'll have some time for some questions. Katia, I'll leave it to you. Uh, thank you, Filippo. This was uh, very interesting. And actually, our audience uh, believe uh, half of it believe in the brighter part of the future, and half of it believe in uh, the darker future. You so see. we have, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, we have uh, quite a few questions here. And uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge we as a society face today? In general, or in relation to technology. Uh, yes, I think in relation to technology. Yeah, as I said, I think we have a big problem of, of control. So uh, I think the big challenge is the shift of power. Uh, so basically, who will control technology, will control politics, uh, the economy, etc. So if you look at the, the simple statistic, uh, if you look at the... Uh, 10 richest persons on the planet right now, some years ago, it would be people in uh, uh, physical business like oil and, and, and so on and so forth. Nowadays, in, I think in the first 10 positions, we have five people who are uh, doing digital businesses. So um, people from Google, Facebook, Amazon is, is Jeff Bezos is probably the richest person or Bill Gates. So what this shows is that the real power Power nowadays is in the hands of people who control technology. Uh, and so I do believe that from this point of view, we should see technology more and more as a political issue and not just as a, you know, uh, something that affects our private life, but not, not the public one. So, and you see that, I mean, the new arm race uh, is not to nuclear power anymore, it's to artificial intelligence, the big uh, international competition is between US, Russia, China. And the big question for me as someone living in Europe is whether Europe will be able to propose a different model of, of development of technology than the one proposed by the other superpowers in the world. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what about ecology? How is ecology integrated in this discourse? Ecology. Yes. Right. So that's, that's another big question, right? Because, uh, of course, climate change and environmental issues are the other big topic today. And, and there are a lot of people believing that technology can be a solution to the uh, climate and environmental problems, which is part of the story in the sense that, indeed, you know, this big data analysis and artificial intelligence can do a lot in terms of, you know, suggesting models uh, to, 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 you know, to counteract climate change, et cetera, et cetera. What many people don't see 
is that technology is also part of the problem. So, you know, all the climate issues and environmental issues we have now are due to the massive uh, industrial uh, development that we've had. And we should not make the mistake of believing that uh, digital technologies do not have an impact. They do. They do have a massive impact on, on the environment. It, you don't see it because it's not direct. It's not like seeing, you know, the smoke coming out of your car, of your house. But indirectly, the production and analysis of, the, of this data is warming up physically, literally, is warming up servers and creating uh, a, a ecological footprint that is still difficult to, to, to evaluate and assess. But indeed, that's very interesting dynamics. Technology can be part of the solution to the ecological problems, but it's also part of the problem. So it's not a, there's no easy way out here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and uh, you've touched on in, in the lecture the concept of uh, black box. Uh, and it seems like you think that we are able to overcome it. But uh, do you think that we're able to truly comprehend the processes that are controlling our life? And is it worth putting effort into, into this? So, to be honest, I, 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 I have two minds here. I am on two minds here. I think that it is in principle possible, and that's the grain of truth of the dream party. But I also believe it's going to be very difficult, and that's a grain of truth in the doom party, so to speak. The reason why I believe it's possible is that we should not look so again, we should look at this as a political problem. So if we look at this from the individual perspective, then of course, none of us will individually be able to understand these processes. But that does not mean that the processes cannot be understood. We can understand the processes as a collective. So again, take politics as an example. Individually, you cannot influence. Uh, so very few people can individually uh, influence the decisions of the government or can understand the complexity of the political process. But that does not mean that the political process is out of control. Why? Because we have complex systems, complex political systems of control, the parliament, the press, uh, and a lot of complex social systems that help us as individuals to mediate our interaction with the power. So I think we should reason in the same way with technology. Individually, we cannot control technology. But as a society, if and only if we set up the right institutions, the right regulations, the right processes, then as a whole, we can be, you know, as a collective, with the right tools as a collective, we can be powerful enough to counteract the power of this complex technology, but certainly not individually. Uh, don't you think that it looks like the concept of uh, society as a whole looks uh, like a complex, the same black box which we are trying to comprehend. Is, aren't we reaching, uh, are we able to reach an end in this argument? No, that's right. No, uh, not in the short run. But again, if you look, I, I'm fascinated by the history of, of politics, right? So if you look at the complex political systems we have now, so years ago, it was unthinkable to have such complex social and political mechanisms and still to be able somehow to govern them, to understand them. I, I totally agree with you, Katya, or whoever has put this question, that it's not easy and it will take time. So as I say, I started by saying that this is probably a, you know, a revolution and every revolution requires a, a big change in the institutions. You know, there is all these so-called populist movements and of course, what they are pointing at is that, uh, in the wrong way, I believe, but they are pointing to the fact that institutions as we have them right now may not be sufficient complex, sufficiently uh, smart and complex to deal with these problems. Now, they, the mistake of the populist is to believe that we need simpler things. Now, we need, we need even more complex things. That would be my answer. Uh, but indeed, it, it, it's difficult because we are looking at really super complex and dynamic systems.
And what do you think about the current situation? What role does COVID play in the development of technology issues? And are there any new directions uh, in tech policy policy that uh, should be considered? You know, COVID has been a, 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 a incredible uh, test in many ways for our, our society. So it has put a lot of pressure on the way we live. Uh, I would have loved to be in Moscow right now, by the way. Um, please invite me again when the COVID will be over because I want to come and visit you physically. But it's, it's good that we've learned to, 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 to work in remote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there have been a lot of political experimentations, et cetera. Now, the big question is, uh, and the, the, again, the big mistake we should not do is to use, to accept the idea that given that there is an emergency, we should uh, give up on everything we, we have known so far from a political and technological point of view. So it has taken decades to put together some awareness of the import or centuries uh, when it comes to politics, to understand the importance of certain principles, certain values, certain processes. And now we should not uh, give in the temptation to say, yeah, but there is this emergency. And so we, we, we should just forget about privacy, forget about uh, protests, forget about gatherings and just stick to whatever it's needed right now. Because the COVID, as, as someone nicely wrote in, in one of these articles that have been around the topic, the COVID will, will pass, hopefully. But the society we are designing in COVID time will remain. So I think we should use COVID not as an opportunity to totally change everything that we have known uh, so far, but should be an opportunity to, to sit down and to say, hey, this is a great opportunity to really address these big issues that have been around for decades and centuries now. How can we balance political control, uh, public health, and individual freedom, the use of technology for societal benefits like these apps for tracing contacts, while maintaining uh, uh, privacy and individual freedom? How can we, again, going back to the social processes, enhance people awareness and knowledge as opposed to just leave people in a position of total ignorance and just being at the mercy of whatever the governments will decide is the right thing to do in, in the face of the emergency. So long story short, to give a short answer, I think we should do, do, use this as an opportunity to make long-term plans uh, for the future as opposed to just try to manage you know, the emergency. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, quite an interesting question about gender. Uh, which gender will be affected the most by uh, AI job replacements? Is there any difference between male and female in this sense? Look, um, I, I don't know. What I can say is if you look at my first slide where I put the uh, examples of technology, this one, and you look, it's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a pun, it's true. Everything is white apart from the, apart from the, of the weapon system. And the hand who is, who is holding the smartphone is a male hand and it's white. And if you search for images around of technology, you will see everywhere just white male uh, hands handling this technology. And this is just a, a sign of the fact that this technological revolution, like all the technological revolutions of the past, have been by and large dominated by males. Uh, and this is definitely not good news for uh, females, but also for minority in general. So that's a great question because the big challenge nowadays, this has to do with the shift of power, is how can we design, this is part of the meaningful human control concept, how can we design technology that it's really responding to the needs of diverse users and not just the majority of users of the most, which in the case of females, they would be the majority, but you know, they are the least powerful. So I don't have the answer about the future, but I can definitely say that if we don't do anything proactively to counterbalance the, the sort of a default of technological development, this will be yet another story of technological development and economical development developed by males for male persons. So I totally agree that this is a super important 
uh, point, diversity, not only in gender, but also in ethnicity, in mental capacities, in language, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I, how can we design technology that will enhance the capacities and opportunities for all of these different users uh, and, and agents, and not only uh, for those who are dominating the technological development? Mm -hmm. Thank you. And what about creative industries? How will artists, poets, and other creatives collaborate with intelligence technologies in the nearest future? That, that's, that's another fantastic opportunity in principle, right? So I've seen, I'm not an expert here, but I've seen fantastic things being done by artists with artificial intelligence that I think, you know, even in music, Uh, and in, in visual arts and in all possible ways of creating uh, things that can, you know, uh, blow up our minds or making, th making us think in, 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 in different innovative ways. Again, the problem is whether there will be spaces for, this, for these things, whether there will be uh, fundings for these things, whether there will be public space for these initiatives. Again, that's a great Uh, question because again it, it, it nicely shows that in principle this is a great opportunity but whether it will realize or not depends on the political and social context in which we will de develop technology if we keep on developing technology mainly as a tool for cutting costs improving productivity uh, and replacing persons uh, from jobs etc etc then I'm afraid that uh, there, there won't be much left for uh, art uh, and, and philosophy for that matter. So we need to rethink the whole process if we want to, to exploit the opportunities that are there in the technology. So for sure, I'm very optimistic in that sense. Technology is not killing creativity per se. What may, what may kill creativity is the the wrong social, political embeddings of technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, and I think we have another question, uh, which is continuing our previous question about uh, minorities uh, and AI. Do you think AI will be available for people all over the world? Will it increase cultural coll collusion between nations? That's another fantastic question. If I look at the, at the trend, of course, there's not much room for optimism. Because, again, as I said before, uh, you see a sort of an arm race to AI. And, of course, in arm races, the big players uh, will prevail. So unless we find a different model to, to see AI as a, as a tool for development, as a such something that should be uh, not only available to, to all, all, all societies in the world, but also... Uh, Uh, open to be created according to the uh, cognitive, uh, societal, ethical, uh, political, uh, local uh, views. Uh, so, if we, if we, so if we don't go in that direction, it's difficult to see AI and technology becoming beneficial for, for minorities or for uh, non-industrialized countries or for countries who at the moment do not have a strong Uh, uh, power in the creation of this technology. But again, if we start seeing this technology as a vital resource, then we should start look at this as any other political and economic resource that should be available to everybody according to their capacities uh, and, uh, and to enhance their capacity to develop whatever legitimate uh, lifestyles they want to develop and not only their lifestyle of the uh, 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 dominating culture uh, in the world. And do you think we can teach AI not only ethics, but also some other things like talent? Can, uh, can artificial intelligence be as talented as human beings are? So can you say that again? I, I missed you for a moment. Sorry, um, there is a question about talent. Uh, can artificial intelligence be talented? Can we teach, as we teach uh, artificial intelligence ethics, can we teach uh, talent as well, or like implement it further? Yeah, I, I think so. Again, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert, so the more the questions go, go in the direction of what is technically feasible, the less I am qualified to answer. 
But again, the opportunities are, 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 are massive. And for sure, I do believe that I'm quite skeptical, for instance, that we can teach uh, ethics in any, in any deep sense at the moment to AI. But I do believe that it could be easier to teach creativity. Because if you think, you know, typically and, and talent and, and skills, because typically these are things that require just a lot of exercise and being exposed to a lot of, of, of information and, and, you know, and, and in that sense, artificial intelligence may have a, a, a great opportunity to, to develop its own uh, skills and to become a great partner. So what, what is something I haven't said so far, and it's, it's nicely triggered by this question, is artificial intelligence can be a great partner. So we should stop seeing artificial intelligence as replacing humans and more and more as uh, interacting with humans, uh, which requires a lot of change in the way we design the, the systems and also ways we interact with the systems, but also can be a way for us to learn, a, a nice way for us to learn new, new skills and for the system itself to, to, to develop beautiful things or innovative things. It all boils down to how we design this interaction and these power relations between the technology and society. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And there is a question about exactly how we design. I think um, you might be able to answer it. Uh, will quantum mechanics, uh, how will quantum mechanics uh, influence uh, the development of artificial intelligence? Will it uh, do it in a, in, a, in a darker way? So the question is whether, so say it again, Quantum mechanics yeah, yeah, yeah. will it influence the AI in in a in a way that it will bring the darker scenario? You know, quantum physics, quantum mechanics, quantum computing. These are all things, as far as I understand. I'm not an expert again, but these are all things adding up to the fascination and 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 scariness of, of this technology. The fascination because it's opening up unprecedented perspectives of power powerful calculations and, and, and performance, while at the same time uh, creating more and more space for this uh, opacity and, and black box features of this system. So for sure, this is one, as I, as I said, I cannot say much more because I'm not an expert here, but definitely this is part of the story about the possibility of AI and uh, digital technologies turning uh, 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 bad as in uh, being obscure and opaque and used uh, for um, so, uh, for in turning realizing uh, efforts and outcomes that are not necessarily beneficial for society uh, at large, for sure. Thank you. Uh, and there is a last question, uh, which is about a film about the essential Sen man. If you have. Uh, ever had a chance to see it. And the question is, will we go uh, by a more uh, empathetic way towards robots with AI? Uh, will we be thinking of uh, uh, giving them rights and considering them as equals? So I'm, I'm quite, quite skeptical about that. So I know that there is a big movement uh, of, of of thought uh, around saying, you know, art AI and robots will become more and more uh, not only partners in the way in which I said before, like in, in performing things, but also moral partners, social partners, even political partners. I'm quite skeptical about this for two reasons. The first is, is, is practical. So as far as I understand, no matter how advanced AI is right now, it's uh, very far from being anything closer to human intelligence as we know it. Um, and, you know, I don't want to play the game of making estimations how long it will take for AI to become comparable to human intelligence in terms of emotions and empathy and social interactions, etc. but it will take a lot of time. So there is time before we get there. The second reason why I'm skeptical is more uh, substantive and normative and ethical. I do believe that this is the wrong focus. So we should focus on human rights and all the topics we have discussed so far and diversity in humanity. There is so much to do 
in creating technology that is supporting human diversity and gender diversity and political inclusion, etc., etc., that I think that focusing on robot rights is not only wrong, but also misleading. It's just turning the attention to something that, to me, is not interesting, is not relevant, and it's possibly uh, obfuscating and you know, hiding more important political and, and, and societal goals. So I would keep focusing on what technology can do for us, how, can, how should we design technology in the way we said so far, rather than focusing on technology or AI as a form of uh, something uh, deserving any form of ethical respect or ethical interaction. Even though this may be a very partial perspective coming from the West, where I come from, I know that, for instance, in Japan, uh, they have a, uh, a, a bigger concern for creating uh, what was uh, suggested in this question. So I also realize that there are cultural differences here, but where I come from culturally uh, and politically, uh, from my perspective, uh, it would be a mistake to focus on this rather than on the other issues we have uh, uh, touched upon uh, so far. Uh, well, this is it with the questions. Uh, Filippo, thank you very much for the lecture and your answers. Thank you very much, Katya, and thanks everybody for your attention. See you in Moscow next time. Cheers. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. This lecture will stay on YouTube and all Stroka social media platforms. Please follow us there and check out stroka.com for more events. Bye.